Welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, we discuss the disparity in attention in the U.S. when it comes to missing people of color. My guest is Derricka Wilson, co-founder of the Black and Missing Foundation. BAMFI works with families of missing loved ones to help them connect with law enforcement, news media, and other resources in an effort to bring attention to and find those who are missing. This is something that I've, I've honestly thought about a lot since my first job as an intern at a news station in L.A., we got a report from a family of a young black girl who was missing, and I called the police station to find out, hey, do you have a news release on this? And they were like, oh, we think it's a runaway, and minimized it. And I remember at the time, we took our cues a lot from official reports. I remember, I mean, it stayed with me, that 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 moment. And now there's language for it, and we were talking about it more, which is really great. I would love to talk with you about why have you taken on this work? Uh, What led you to create BAMFI? I started the organization nearly 14 years ago with my sister-in-law, Natalie Wilson. Uh, My background is in law enforcement and Natalie is in public relations. And those are the two critical professions needed in finding our missing. The inspiration behind the organization was a young lady that went missing from my hometown. Her name was Tamika Houston. And despite the fact that her aunt was in public relations, they still struggled to garner local coverage, much less national coverage. And months later, Natalie Holloway disappeared and her name became a household name. And of course, we all know her name. And and it's not to dishonor Natalie or any other families. It it really bothered me. And I, during a family function at my house, um, I, I talked to her about this issue And we decided to start doing some research to see how big of an issue this is in our community. So when we started the organization in 2008, we discovered that 30% of missing persons in the United States were persons of color, and that number has since increased to 40%. Now, we know the number is even higher than 40%. And that's because, according to the FBI statistics, They break the missing persons down in race, and we have a category for Black, we have a category for Asian, we have a category for Indian, there's no category for Hispanic. They're actually classified in the white population. We decided, why not us? We identified a problem in our community, and in order to solve the problem, you have to be willing to be the solution. And so with my background and Natalie's background, we decided to join forces to help us find us to start this organization to help families that are desperate in finding their loved ones. Were you surprised when you started looking into the research and finding what you found? I was absolutely surprised. It, you know, it really bothered me with Tamika's case because when I looked at Tamika Houston, she reminded me of my sister. She reminded me of my nieces, um, you know, family members. I saw her as a family member. It really hit home for me. When we started the organization nearly 14 years ago, it hit home for people in our community because we hit the ground running. And so when we were going into our community and we were sharing profiles and flyers of our missing black and brown men and women and children, the community was appalled because when they turned their televisions on, they didn't see anyone that looked like us. And so we really needed to change the narrative. Missing persons isn't a black issue. It's not a white issue. It's an American issue. And we all have a responsibility. Absolutely. You know, the missing persons, it's historically indigenous women in Canada, in the U.S., uh, black women, obviously white, white women as well. I mean, no one wants to see anyone be harmed or go missing. Sometimes this is treated like a zero sum game. And it is true that there's limited time, there's limited space for coverage. However, it's not to minimize the harm or the tragedy. And so I'd love for if you could address that idea of, you know, you're minimizing my pain by trying to bring your pain in or your efforts in. What what would you say to that? You know, first I would like to address that every family that has a missing loved one, their heart bleeds the same way. It doesn't matter what your race, what your gender. 
not knowing is devastating. Not knowing if your loved one is hungry, if they're hurt, if they're cold, if they're being mistreated, if they're ever going to walk through the front door again. That not knowing, just, just think about if you misplaced your cell phone or your car keys, you're in a panic, your anxiety hits the roof. Now multiply that times 1,000 plus of someone that has a missing loved one. What we have seen with the Black and Missing Foundation, the families that we're serving you know, when they come to us, oftentimes we're their last hope. And, and they make that very clear um, when all of the doors have closed in their face. You know, we're here when they go and they try to file a police report for their missing loved one, especially when it's a child. Oftentimes their cases are labeled as runaways. Runaways are not receiving the Amber Alert. And quite frankly, there's no sense of urgency in finding them. And so, you know, you have society being very judgmental, you know, she's being fast or she's being promiscuous and, you know, things of that nature. And, and oftentimes it's so far from the truth. And when it comes to missing men and women, black or brown, their disappearance is often associated with some sort of criminal activity. And quite frankly, it really desensitized and dehumanized the fact that that loved one is missing. You know, I, I'm thinking about a case that came to our organization just last evening where this mother reached out because her son has been missing for one year. And he, years ago, a little misdemeanor situation, but when her son went missing, she filed a missing persons report. She provided law enforcement with a picture. They decided to use the mugshot of her son versus the picture that she provided. And when you put that out to the masses and you create a flyer, you know, I read through the comments. He's missing because of his criminal behavior, his background, not recognizing that that is not that person anymore. Number one. Number two, this is someone's son. This is someone's daughter. This is someone's brother, sister, mother, father, grandma, grandfather. You know, these families are hurting. And so we really have to change the narrative on how cases are really classified and how they're handled. We need, number one, law enforcement to take these cases seriously and, and classify them accordingly. We also need more diversity in the uh, commanding rankings for law enforcement. We need enhanced training for cultural diversity and sensitivity training for law enforcement. And I'm a former cop myself, so I, I feel like I can speak on this. And when it comes to the media, we need more diversity in the newsroom because the decision makers don't look like us. And then lastly, we need the community to see something and say something. You know, we have to get out of our own way of no snitching. So it's all of our responsibility. And when it all works in the perfect way, we can get a lot accomplished together. I appreciate that. A lot of levels, the law enforcement level, the news media level, community uh, comfort with, with speaking up. All of those issues are really important to to address. You know, you brought up the issue of, of mugshots, and there's a move among the wider news community to stop having mugshot galleries, to stop using mugshots in stories because they're such powerful visuals in a specific direction. Right. Um, especially when someone's been the victim of a crime, as we're talking about here. Have you been working with law enforcement agencies or news media to sort of bring that to light? We do work with law enforcement on these cases because we don't want to step on anyone's toes. Um, you know, missing persons is not considered a crime. Um, and we want them to look at us as an added resource because we know that there's not a lot of resources dedicated to missing persons. We're still building those relationships with law enforcement as well as with our media partners. But it's very important to tell a different story. It's also important for families to understand the power of images as well. There's multiple times, you know, in situations where we go back to the family and we're like, please provide us with additional photos because the ones that you provided, they're not a good representation. 
of your missing loved one. Um, we really stress the importance of headshots, very clear pictures. You know, a lot of times people want to use filters. And when we get these families that reach out to us, for example, the one that reached out last evening, you know, we put the posts out there with the appropriate photo and we will tag law enforcement. This is the image that people need to see. They don't need to see the mugshot. You know, that has nothing to do with the fact that this person is missing. That has nothing to do with the fact that this mother is crying daily because she doesn't know where her 22-year-old son is. And that's so important because if I'm in the middle of the worst moment of my life or the worst situation of my life, my, my loved one is missing, I am not thinking about how do I present this? How do I, how do I do the PR? How do I communicate this? I'm just thinking about, oh my God, please someone help me. And so having your organization there to help guide families and do that work so that they can focus on what they need to focus on, that's wonderful. Helping these families with, you know, even the flyers, because oftentimes law enforcement may be a little slow moving with creating a flyer for their missing loved one. And what we have seen over and over again is that families take matters into their own hands and they're creating flyers of their missing loved ones and they're putting their personal information out there and now they're being victimized because they're being scammed so they're receiving calls from individuals claiming to know the whereabouts of their loved one and and, and ransom so we've had families to lose their entire savings. We've had families to even lose their homes because they've been victimized at their most vulnerable and weakest point. When, when they come to us, they're at their low. And what we have tried to do is meet them where they are. And we're also trying to help them navigate this without being victimized when they upload their loved one on our website and we're able to verify that there is a police report on file, this person is actually missing, it automatically comes with a flyer that has law enforcement's number and our number. That way they no longer have to put their contact and they don't have to worry about becoming a victim. That is an aspect of this that I hadn't even thought about. That, of course, there are people out there wanting to capitalize and scam and, and take advantage. I just hadn't even thought about that, but of course. And and that just adds to your tragedy. And, and again, why it's so wonderful that you're there. You used to be a, a, in law enforcement. Could you talk to me a little bit about that perspective when you were in law enforcement and these cases would come in? Can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like and how you may have advocated inside that space? You know, when I started my law enforcement career and I attended a police academy, you know, I recall spending, you know, maybe an hour or two on missing person cases. As a, a newbie on the force, when I had my first missing person case, you know, it's a lot to really navigate. There's a lot of paperwork that's associated with it. There's a lot of steps that you must take, you know, as far as the missing persons report, entering the information into NCIC, which is the National Crime Information Center, interviewing neighbors, getting information from the schools, you know, depending on what that situation is. And, and I saw a bigger issue. I don't like to use the term runaways because if the parents don't know where the children are, they're missing. We have to ask ourselves, what are they running from and who are they running to? Because clearly there's something wrong. And then when it comes to the adults, I mean, I've actually witnessed whether it's, you know, former colleagues or even neighboring jurisdictions just simply didn't take those cases as seriously, especially when it's an adult, because, you know, they say, well, adults can come and go as they please, you know, but you know when something isn't right. And the numbers really speak for itself. So when I served on the force and I served in Virginia, I was the first and only black female police officer for the agency that I worked for. But I was also the community service police officer, too, because my community is very important. So I've always taken a proactive approach to things. I'm not a reactive person. How do we protect ourselves before something happens? And so there were classes that I used to teach. And from me serving as a police officer and getting that training, I've been able to take those same tools 
along with what Natalie is bringing to the table from the media perspective. So we are actually a proactive organization. Like we are encouraging families have those uncomfortable conversations with your children, teaching them about internet safety, sitting down at the dinner table without the devices and talk about real life issues and listen you know, as parents, um, checking in on your elderly, we teach self-defense classes, you know, how to protect yourself. So those are what I can bring to the table based on my experience. And then just speak in the same language as police officers. You know, when the families are coming to us, we're coaching them because oftentimes there are cases where police didn't even take the police report. And we want to coach them on what they need to say, how they need to say it. So they can get their story out there and get a police report and we can move forward. Well, I wanted to go back to the point you made about runaway versus kidnapped and the idea of whether or not those distinctions are helpful, because those distinctions do play into in a large way who gets coverage. I love what you said about what are they running from and what are they running to? Especially, I mean, I think it's always relevant, but especially in a digital age in w- where you can be enticed. And maybe someone didn't come into your home and kidnap you, but they digitally enticed you out. Absolutely. And you're still in the same harm's way that you would have been um, had you been kidnapped. That is definitely something that I think a lot of people don't think about. One of the questions that we would ask is, how can a stranger enter your home without walking through your front door? And it's through your devices. We're still in a pandemic. Although things are opening back up, we were... 18 months where kids were going to school virtually and some are still going to school virtually. And we have seen an uptick in our cases of youth going missing during the pandemic because while their parents were working or even looking for jobs, these predators were luring them because they were spending so much time online or so much time on their gaming systems or so much time on these apps. I would say to parents, you know, this is the time to not be your children's friend, but be their parent and be that nosy parent. It's okay to to look through and see who they're communicating with. It's okay to see what apps they're downloading. It's okay to sit in their room while they're playing their game and have that conversation because that can potentially save their life. You would rather have that uncomfortable conversation than to file a missing persons report because your your child is missing. Yeah, absolutely. There are consequences to not doing that. That is an incredible point of information that there have been more children going missing during the pandemic. And it tracks right with the fact that we're spending a ton more time online. You're listening to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. We're talking with Derricka Wilson of the Black and Missing Foundation about bringing attention to missing people of color. We place a lot of stock in getting coverage for a missing person's case. The term, the missing white woman syndrome is, oh, missing white woman's going to get attention and uh, missing women of color are not going to get attention. What is the importance of news coverage? Why why does this matter so much? Lacey Peterson, Natalie Holloway, Chandra Levy, Elizabeth Smart, Kaylee Anthony, Gabby Petito. Those are just six names that I was able to roll off my tongue. And our heart goes out to those families. I would like for someone to name one just one missing person of color that has garnered mainstream media, just one. It doesn't exist. Gabby Petito, I I applaud her father. I've, I've been watching this coverage over the past few weeks. Her father has come out several times to say, you know, he appreciates the attention that his daughter has received. But in the same breath, he's also said, There are so many others that deserve attention. And as a one of the founders of the organization, I I know both Nally and I are receiving calls from families that we serve and, and new families that are learning about us. They're asking us, why is my case any different? You know, what we have witnessed over the past few weeks is our tax dollars you know, where FBI has been involved, all the local police jurisdictions have been involved, 
Um, they brought out the drones, the cadaver dogs, the divers, the four wheelers. Meanwhile, we have Daniel Robinson, who's missing out of Arizona. His father, Mr. David Robinson, a army veteran. He served our country on the front lines. And now his country is not helping him to find his son. He has had to hire a private investigator, a search team. You know, his son has been missing since June of this year, 2021. And the police haven't cooperated with the family. And so that's very hurtful. So when we're hearing from families asking, why is my child any different? Or why is my mother or, or, or my, my spouse any different? Media coverage is so vital because it, it does two things. It alerts the public that someone is missing, which is a call to action so people can be vigilant in the community to come forward to say something. But number two is very critical because it applies pressure on law enforcement to exhaust additional resources to try to bring that individual home or closure for that family. That's an excellent point. And to your point, Mary Johnson, the indigenous uh, woman who went missing several months ago, in the wake of Gabby Petito's disappearance and, and murder, there was some scrutiny about, hey, why is no one paying attention to this case? And then the FBI is like, oh, well, we'll offer a $10,000 reward, which, yes, please, my God, let's try to help this family and this missing woman. But that it it actually took coverage. It took attention to nudge resources or to convince those who had control over the resources to apply them. There's another aspect that I found interesting in my research to discuss this with you. I read an article about the fact that, um, you know, we've got traditional news media, you know, newspapers, TV, radio, but we've also got digital media. There are a lot of people out there who are just true crime fans, TikTokers of, of various stripes, and that the true crime community and TikTokers are using their platforms to draw attention to cases of missing people of color, to really intentionally and deliberately talk about this and fill in the gaps where it's not happening in traditional media. I applaud that. And, and we, with our organization, we are utilizing all platforms because we understand not every case is going to elevate to mainstream media. Not every case is going to make the five and 10 o'clock news cycle, but we are very resourceful. And if we are able to get law enforcement to take the report, to create the flyer, share the flyer on their website, share the flyer on their social media platforms, share the information with the media outlets when they're calling these respective jurisdictions to ask for news stories and these news outlets are shared it on their platform. If you don't know, you don't know. If the information is not being put out there, how can the public help? The perfect case study is a young girl that went missing from Baltimore, Maryland. You know, police took the police report. They shared the information with the media outlets and, and the family reached out to us. So we shared with our media partners to cover a story. Uh, we had a partnership with digital media as well, um, and they shared the flyer on their platform. The Uber driver ended up seeing the flyer and contacted our organization because he actually was the driver that transported her when the traffickers was using that Uber app as the transportation. Whoa. And so this young lady was missing for approximately seven days. She was trafficked from Baltimore to DC, back to Prince George's County. And because police took the report and put the information out because the media covered the story, a vigilant citizen contacted us and we, in turn, contacted the police as well as the FBI, and she was recovered. That's the perfect case study when all parties come together and work for the greater good. That is an incredible story. And that's all that these families want. They want to know that people, that they're not in this by themselves. We want them to be hopeful, and we want them to understand that their loved ones matter. You know, time is of the essence. 
when someone goes missing and every minute of every day that goes by of not knowing, you know, the chances get slimmer and slimmer. And so I think even from, you know, a holistic standpoint, we really need to look at how these cases are handled. So for example, in Washington, D.C. and in Illinois, if you have a missing loved one, it doesn't matter what their age is, child, adult, elderly, you can report your loved one missing immediately. But in certain states, you may have to wait 24 hours. Now, it is a myth that you have to wait 48 to 72 hours like it is on some of these, you know, CSI shows and things of that nature. It is devastating. I, I was actually on the phone with Mr. Robinson the other day. That's uh, Daniel Robinson's son, the one that's missing out of Arizona. He's a black geologist. And his father reported him missing. The police told him, well, you know, you have to wait about 12 more hours before you can report him missing. So he literally just sitting there waiting before he can file a missing persons report for his son. Oh, God. That's devastating. That's devastating. You know, we're here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And of course, as with every community, there are people who've been affected and who are missing um, and who need attention and need help from us to be found. So I'm wondering if you'd be willing to talk to me a little bit about any cases you know that we might be able to elevate here. There are two cases that just come right to mind. Ariana Fitz, she's missing out of the area. Um, sadly, her mother was uh, found murdered a few years ago, but she may have been two years old at the time. Just a devastating case. There's been an age progression photo of her. We feel that she is still alive and um, somebody may be raising her as their own. And we just need people to be very vigilant. And, um, you know, children change, their features change. So our partners at the National Center, they've created a age enhancement photo. And then there's another young man, Jonathan Bambadillo. He's been missing. He was on his way to a soccer match and, you know, he disappeared. And his family, they have been fighting law enforcement because, again, you know, the case wasn't taken seriously. And there's this notion that maybe he had like some sort of mental health breakdown. You know, there's always excuses, it seemed to be, when it's, you know, missing persons of color. It's, it's always something. But those are two cases just to highlight just right off the top. But there are plenty more. There are so many more cases, you know, out of that area of missing individuals. And, you know, again, they all deserve coverage, sharing all of their photos. Somebody may know something. It could be a serial abductor in the area. I mean, that's why it's so important to, to get these images out there because you just never know. Right, exactly. Is there anything else that you would like to say that I haven't asked that you think it's important for people to know? I would just like to encourage all the listeners. This is a call to action. You know, we need to drive change. You know, we need to demand change when it comes to diversity on the police forces, diversity in the newsroom, community involvement. And if you are on social media, it's so important to not just like our post. We want you to share our post because one tweet, one share could solve a case. All it takes is one. And we know that someone knows something. And we just need that someone to come forward with the information to end this nightmare for these families. You may hold the key to end the nightmare. Thank you to my guest, Derricka Wilson, co-founder of the Black and Missing Foundation. We've posted the flyers of missing people mentioned here to newsincontext.net as well as a link to the organization's website, bamfi.org, where you can find more flyers and links to Bamfi's social media. Music in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing news in context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, iHeartMedia, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, and PRX. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at News in Context SF and on Instagram at News in Context. And you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening. <laughs>